We've got Jim Hepler, did I pronounce that correctly, here to talk to you about Secure Access Zero Trust. Um, he's got a very interesting pr presentation for us tonight, so if you give him your attention, that'd be great. Thank you very much. How's everyone doing tonight? Everyone all right? Everyone good? Do you have enough in your life to base a movie on? Raise your hand if you do. Two, three, four, six, seven. Hey, I just said a movie. So anyway, thank you so much for having me uh, today. Bob Chandler's with me as well. And uh, I've been privileged to be in cybersecurity, marketing, public relations, touring music. So I've had a, uh, journalism, I've had an interesting career arc. And today what we wanna do, we're gonna get into IoT, we're gonna get into all kinds of solutions. I'm CISSP trained. I've worked with the federal government. We've been touring with the uh, intelligence agencies the last 18, 19 months. That's really fun. And I come at this like I'm a journalist. And uh, so what I want to do to just change it up a little bit uh, is kind of go through some fun facts, talk about where we've been, where we're going, hopefully get everyone thinking. Uh, who, who's in security? Everyone in the room is secure. Is security audience? Forgive the rhetorical questions. Technology, everyone's technology, pretty much. All right, that's cool. So uh, I'm just going to start out. If you think in terms of where we've been and where we're at, while I talk about the background, here is your typical commercial insert company here talking in terms of how the world's changed. How many average devices do you, uh, number of devices do most people use at any given time? Let's see how well you know some stats. According to Poneman, give me a number, anyone. Four to seven. How many uh, new additions to the World Wide Web are coming on every single year according to Gartner and Poneman? Give me a number, what's the number? A billion five. How many total end users are going to be on the World Wide Web by 2023? Anybody? Anybody? 23 billion. And think in terms of, remember how they count it, number of devices. How many IoT devices are going to come on to the online onto the World Wide Web by the end of this year? What's the average number every six months? 30 million. So I just want to set the table to make you all feel fun about your job. But here is your ubiquitous, the world is changing commercial produced by our company. There's some really great sing-songy music and a great narrator that tells you that we cover it all. And we do a pretty good job as well as a lot of different companies, right? But the world has tr changed tremendously. And what I want to do is kind of go through that arc of the change once we get through this. And if you think in terms of what you're challenged to do every single day, raise your hand if you think we're succeeding. Not a single hand. <laughs> I always love to ask this question too. I get blessed and privileged to do a lot of different cool audiences all over the Americas. How many people think they see everything that's hitting their network? Raise your hand. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in Dallas, someone, and this was a good room. I mean, it was like a huge hotel convention center vibe, about six, 700 people. I'm working it. I'm working the towel. It's hot up there, but I feel like I'm on point. And I asked that question waiting for like, you can drop a pen. You, you can hear the nickel drop. And some dude right sitting right where these six gentlemen are raises his hand and says, I do. I'm like, oh, shit, excuse my French. What do I do with that? I'm like, okay, well, then I quit. Come on up. You take it over from here. I'm done, right? Well, all of my training, all of everything that I've done in my career, I ended up finding out after the presentation that the gentleman worked with the NSA, and he worked with the Bush administration, and he worked at that huge NSA data center post 9-11 when we tracked every device, every email, and they rotated a full NSA sock of 1,500 separate workers on three separate eight-hour shifts, and he was the supervisor of the night shift. So when he said, he goes, 
to be honest with you, we get about 99, 99.5. So to your point, you're right. We still miss 0.5. So always watch when you ask those questions. So I, it, I was telling the organizers, and thanks to Brandon, Sharon, and everyone who's had, had us out today, had me out today, you'll find out for me that slides are suggestions, right? I mean, it's like I work stand-up or I'm like a front man in a band. But so a little bit of a re repeat here. But if you think in terms of 23 billion new end users by 2020, and let's go by five, times 30 billion IoT devices, this is according to Gartner, this is in, in the Poneman uh, study, read Poneman. It's the most exhaustive study. I was at HP Vice Storm when they started it. We were one of the sponsors along with IBM. What's great about it is they interview everyone that matters, including our enemies, the Chinese, the Iranians, university, higher ed, everyone around the, the world, and it's exhaustive. It's five or six years, and it really is a good barometer of what's coming down the pike, right? And so a question that I love to ask folks like yourselves, very, I've been listening in on conversations, you know, as an as a ex-journalist, you're trained to listen. As you know, anyone that's worth their salt, listen, right? Presentation Brandon just did, I learned something today. That was pretty cool, how you can use encryption and algorithms, and he just picked out five, and that was pretty interesting how he did that. The in intuition there is great, right? So if you think in terms of what's coming down the pike, what is your plan? What's our plan? Can we keep up with it, with it all? And who's going to win, the machines or the humans? Raise your hand if you think machines win. Wow, I love this audience, about half. Who, who chooses that the humans win? And think in terms of all of the change. I mentioned my career arc, right? What's technology done to music, right? It's free now. You expect it to be free. You download it. There was a time where people went out. I know you'll, you'll go ahead and laugh. I don't want to date myself. People would spend 10 to $20 on a slab of wax or on a recorded disc, and they would put it on a machine. They would buy the merch. Now everything is ubiquitous. Music should just be there, right? Everyone's experience should just be there. I was at an IoT event with General Motors, a lot of vehicle manufacturers, in Detroit, April 30th, we were on a round table, and the head of vehicle development for General Motors, in five years, he, five to eight years, let's see if this comes out to be true, because remember, if, if we were supposed to be like the Jetsons, we were supposed to be flying around in cars, it hasn't gone that extreme yet, but what do you think is going to be eliminated pretty much or reduced, according to GM's head of vehicle development, by 70, 80% by the year 2028 is what he's hedging on. He's wrote a book on. What do you think is going to be eliminated or near eliminated? People owning cars. Who drove their own car tonight? Dinosaurs. All of you. What's coming down the pike is pools of vehicles, right? I, want, I like sports cars. I pay 700 a month. There's a huge lot of, of awesome sports cars. Every brand, I'm an SUV guy. I like a certain experience with my vehicle. And then I end up paying four to $500 a month. When I want my car, I just go online. I order my vehicle for the day or the two days that I want, jump in the vehicle, take it for my trips, go for two days, put it back on the lot, have a nice day. Driverless vehicles are coming, right? Public transportation. People look, and how often, think about this. This is some fun facts I learned just walking around listening. How long, or what's the percentage that a vehicle is sitting, not used, not in motion? 90%. Dude, that dude gets a slice of pizza. So now I want to talk about one of my mentors. He works at Intel now. 25 years for the Pentagon, some more fun, thought-provoking stuff. His name is Carl Herberger. I always hate it because I had to do it once every year, the last three years, where you look at a program, uh, Carl Herberger, and then I have to follow him. The guy is the Einstein of cyber. Worked with the Pentagon, 
worked with uh, uh, in some of the uh, in the first Mid East wars. One of the inventors of encryption and authentication. A brilliant guy, and he launched like the whole security cybersecurity practice for SunGuard, and was behind the group that took on 9/11 took the entire AT&T network offline to a private network in SunGuard out of New York City in 12 minutes and then switched the AT&T network over to the military and moved those all around and did it in 13 minutes. So he has a great concept, and do this sometime. Who has an ego in the room? Raise your hand. Good. I, I love that six people admit that they have an ego. The rest of you people are just full of you know what. You're sitting there. Not me. I'm humble. Fully you I'm very I have a lot of humility. I'm self aware. Anyway, Mr. Herberger has a comment. Avatar you versus real you. How many hats do you wear? And to quote the who, who are you? Right? Google yourself sometime. Nothing ever leaves the web. Everyone because everyone thinks, ah, I erased that. It exists somewhere. It's like nuclear fallout. Your digital footprint is everywhere. And I want to go back to what all of you do. You all are security people. You're in charge of your networks. We've just established. Uh, I'll ask you another fun question. How many applications go to market with known, and this is according to Poneman, last year, with known security flaws, we're going to fix it in beta 2. Pick a number. How, what, who, what, 44%. I like your cynicism. He also admits he has an ego. He's going to solve it all. I love that guy. But avatar you versus real you, right? Think in terms of what you do. You have children. You have baseball games. Some of you volunteer at church. Some of you go to Red Hat. Some of you people are in freaky whatever clubs that you do you think no one sees all of you are if you're doing four to seven devices and contractors are now used in the marketplace 40 50 percent of the time the cloud who owns the security in the cloud anyone know no one they point fingers at it right so if you think about avatar you versus real you how many hats do you wear and Mr. Herberger, here's something really cool if you want to think about how fast everything's going. And trust me, as you get older, it gets faster. The horse was a primary means of transportation and a military tool in battle for thousands of years. And finally, in the late 1800s, the bicycle evolves into the Wright brothers and now we've got the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. We have Henry Ford and we have the Mercedes-Benz Corporation, all of them battling to get the first motor vehicle out off of the bicycle. The Wright brothers are getting a huge ponderous machine in the air for 19 seconds. And what used to take thousands of years of bovine agri agricultural, think in terms of how quick it went from, oh, World War I, a blend of mustard gas and horses and brutal warfare to all of a sudden in the 30s you see vehicles with the capability of going 80 miles an hour, the combustion engine. And look at the machines that come of age in World War II. And then here's a fun fact and why I talk about uh, cybersecurity at a midlife crisis because all of us think because of these ubiquitous machines and I just encrypted onto my Pulse laptop, which or my laptop, which transferred and recorded that I'm doing this presentation on my phone, and then that syncs up with my OneDrive. When, when was the internet, and when was, I would say, 70 to 80 percent of what we call modern life truly invented? What decade, anybody? The 50s. Al Gore did not invent the internet. The internet came out of World War II and all the additional data and space that we had for things like the telegraph and intercepting transmissions from Japan and Germany, right? McDonald's started in the 50s. The ubiquitous fast food. Vehicles really took a big step up. The space program. Now think in terms, following my line of thought, back with Mr. Herberger, and he talks in terms of when the internet came on board and when we went from we I've left out telephones 
telecommunications, television, radio. And we go from 1955 to 2019 and think in terms of how fast everything has gone from that time on. CPUs, how quick everything, like the great comedian Louis C.K., I know he's out of sorts because he couldn't control himself backstage a long time ago, but he's still very funny. And he had a great comment, and I want everyone to think about it. He talks about, who anyone is, uh, like his comedy, let's just keep it to his comedy, he's funny. And he has a great comment. Louis C.K. says, I'm standing in line. He's bitching about millennials, you know common target and that's bullshit by the way millennials are great every you know it's it's just more i walked uphill in the snow but he's sitting behind millennials the ex the peop, the generation that's had all of this technology since they were five and he's standing at the starbucks and these two gentlemen in front of them with the backward baseball hats and snapping the gum say i hate this effing website i can't get anything to download in 30 seconds screw it and Louis C.K. couldn't resist. He said, I don't know what planet you're from, but I hope you realize that your signals went from that piece of plastic 30,000 miles up into the sky, hit a satellite, bounced back down to your little piece of plastic, and it took 30 seconds. And we're also probably the people that bitch that we jump into a shiny metal object and go 600 miles an hour in airplanes. We take that for granted, how ubiquitous all of that is, right? So avatar you versus real you, Google yourself, see everywhere you show up, look at the number of devices, think in terms of the number of networks you hit, social media, we're going to get into that a little bit. So now let's go to the news and think in terms of how fast we're going Remember I talked about Carl, what it took from 1955 till now. Now we're getting into machine learning. We're getting into behavioral analytics. We're getting into automation, driverless cars. Where do you think we're going to be at in the next 25 years, ladies and gentlemen? Think about it. So now this, I'm just going to peruse the headlines. And the question is, I like this audience because most of you think we're failing, which... And I, you, I can argue either side, right? But CBS News, Jill Schlesing, Schlesinger, excuse me, Wall Street Journal, talking about the mobile payment revolution. And m millennials and the next generation, I think it's Y or X, I can't keep track of it all. We're all going to be reporting to them. I'll be reporting to many of you very soon. I already am. The disruptive change that's happening now, 70% trust Google, Amazon over physical banks. 70% of millennials trust mobile transactions over banking. 33% of millennials expect to not use banks at all in five years. And guess where banking, retail, healthcare industry is all rushing to? Mobile. Where are most of our customers, every organization I've went to and I've worked for and been privileged to work for, our biggest customers are the customers that you're running away from because they're going to keep up with you. You have to be ubiquitous. The experience that we have has to be seamless. Like the two gentlemen at Starbucks, it to took 30 seconds. And even look at this audience. You're, not, you're more attentive than most. I always love doing this. I, I would love, Sharon, Kenny, get up, get a box, everyone's phone, everyone's laptop into a box. I sometimes open with that. You should see people freak. And I bring it up to talk about how attached we've become to a digital reality. I'm not judging it. It's a lot of fun. But one of the things I was thinking about as I prepared to talk with you today is could we live with rewinding out of the vehicle world? Most likely. We'll figure that out. But could you take away, and I'm going to get into how we're failing. And this is sometimes when I speak, I literally, I didn't do it today. I could have probably went and got the Des Moines Register, the USA Today, and every single day, I find failure in our world. But will any of you, my, with my metaphor, give up your phone, give up your iPad, give up your network, give up your Netflix, give up what we've come to assume, and now I'm going to show you the mistakes that we accept to keep this world going. Now here, 
again, uh, and I, I have presentations in the next two weeks where I will. I walk in with a newspaper or a Time magazine, and here's the cover from today, folks. How we doing? Failing or winning? Losing? Tie? Here is, uh, an, an, er, last week, during the uh, Quest Diagnostic hack, Anne-Marie Green, I'm a news junkie, I'm up early, she reports on the Quest Diagnostics, uh, almost 12 million patient records. This is literally her reaction. And she's talking to a reporter on the Wall Street floor. She goes, this happens every day. It's another hack, another failure. You guys failed, you ladies failed, yet we're not going to give it up, are we? And is anyone, who's, who's a Quest Diagnostic customer in here? I'll keep my hand up. I just had some procedures done that they were part of. We become numb to it. You can have my records. Go ahead and try to raid the bank account. Sometimes I think this is a conspiracy for, by LifeLock. Think about that, right? LifeLock is behind all of this, Des Moines. So think in terms, how many people still use Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram? How many people are still on social media? You're beco we're becoming numb. 540 million Facebook user records with two AWS servers that weren't encrypted. Forgive me, I'm going to go old school gospel on you. We're not encrypted. Facebook. This guy's supposed to be the uber genius, right? And he doesn't have his AWS servers encrypted or protected. Think in terms of that, Mark. That's just stunning. He admitted it in front of Congress. How about Georgia Tech? Inventors of some of the coolest cyber projects, regulations, methodologies. Brand new could fit in at Georgia Tech. They do that on steroids. Their analytical and behavioral analytic programs are amazing. 1.3 million student alumni records lost this spring. Going back 70 years. Lost. Oops. Database wiped out. First American Realty of New York City. Since 2003, anything on their website, any record, I have to laugh. You can go right on their website and take down any record, any sale that they've been selling since 2003. They just discovered it a month ago. 885 million records right from the website. Hold on. That is an exclamation point. I know we're laughing, but this is, I mean, New York City, one of the top real estate firms, right? We've covered Quest. This is from CBS. Scott Pelley report about six weeks ago. Think about this, Des Moines. 25% of major cities. Des Moines has been attacked. You, you did not pay. You turned your back and said, screw it, and you had everything backed up. God bless you. But 25% of U.S. cities have been held for ransomware. Winning or losing? How are we doing? Let's keep it rolling. The secure access news service, as I like to call it. To start the year, Wall Street Journal's Ian Bremmer, EuroAsia report, the challenge is the number two challenge facing the world, other than our battle with China for world dominance, is going to be cyber mischief, warf warfare, and attacks on global environments. Our erstwhile president and the Republicans, I don't want to get political, I'm just reporting the facts here, refuse to acknowledge that the Russians tampered with the election in 2016. There has been $500 million dedicated to fix the vulnerabilities in our election system. Guess how much they've spent? It was in this morning's paper. Guess. Pick a number. Zero. Not one dollar. They won't acknowledge it happened. Think about that. It's going to get worse. And, and eight years ago, 12 years ago, everyone tries to agree amongst the Chinese and the Iranians and the Russians that we're going to play nice with intellectual capital. We're going to do the, the right thing. We're not going to steal intellectual property. Long story short, 
It's gotten a lot more tense the last three years. All bets are off. Marriott, Yahoo, Target, who got, who got gutted by Equifax? Raise my hand again. I'm supposedly a cyber expert. You're la- laugh at me, please, right now. I mean, chuckle. Thank you. More, I need more spirit than that. Go there we go. But half of America's population has been compromised on the web. Half. 300 million. And then I want to tell the story about one of my mentors during the SafeNet two-factor authentication time in my life. You talk about security. If you read CISSP handbook and you keep up on your studies, they talk more than cyber. They talk physical. They talk human. They talk weaponry. If you get the expanded version, Sion Gonan, he's now doing borderless servers, servers that need no border, no cloud. They float. They're ubiquitous. He can make the servers go to any form you want. He can make a server work off your car radio. Guy's amazing. He was a CTO. And, and, and I'll tell you his backstory. 15 years old, Israeli. Both of his parents killed. They were in Mossad. He's part of the Israeli military. Got into their cyber practice when he was 15. And if you forget nothing else about this presentation, this is what I'm famous for. LinkedIn with me. Put it in the subject line. It's his line. I steal from the best. I got to present with him at Lambeau Field last summer. He's just amazing. I learned you, people that you learn from, like Carl Herberger and him, he has one thing. Encrypt more shit. <laughs> encrypt everything. However, if we encrypt everything and your life becomes less productive, right? Encrypt everything. It's a good, I mean, I would love this to be a corporate uh, a corporate uh, value statement, a mission statement. Encrypt more shit, stuff, things, people, services, devices, processes, applications. Encrypt your whole damn life if you can. How fun would that be, though? I have to, right now, this mic, the microphone won't work. Do you have the password for the microphone? The microphone's off. Do you have the password for the microphone? I can't untie my shoes. I have to encrypt my shoes. I, I, everything is encrypted. I, I, to have this conversation, you're talking to me. Hold on, will you encrypt so I can understand? He sounds like Chinese. Think about the lack of productivity if we don't learn how to encrypt and authenticate and monitor and do this in real time and be proactive. We're in a post-breach world, ladies and gentlemen. It's, everyone's been hacked. It's what you do. It's how fast you get to it. Average length of a hack. Everyone knows this. Security 101. You guys are smart. What, what is it, ladies? How, how long? What's the average time before someone discovers? Oh, this microphone was just hacked for 30, 30 seconds. But what's the average time once they get in before they move on it? Six months. This dude's good, right? I'm a, oh, come on up here. I'm going to go have a drink. Here you go. Six months. much time everyone into this you want me to keep going you another 10 minutes i'm, I'm, I'm allowed to keep going i, li- I like shit you two, two more songs two more do a ballad though you're uh, a lot of people you're you're rocking it too hard do a new a nice ballad all right here's what i'm going to get into a little bit then in this not a commercial you can do this with a lot of people a lot of great organizations but Really what we have to get our arms around as a country, as a nation, as a world, and I'll ask another rhetorical question. Stupid questions, but when you see all the failures, they're not so stupid. What's the weak link in any security policy? Human people, human beings. Yet human beings are authoring and managing multi-cloud secure access drives and challenges. They're managing the key requirements. You, you know the a key cliche I love? People don't know what they don't know. They have no idea where the gaps are at. What are the tenets for success? How do you build secure access? The reason I always say encrypt more shit, if you could have little eyes, little guards, 
little men and women with guns on every conversation, every device, every application, monitoring. Jim, this Yahoo email is bad. Do not open it. Wouldn't that be great? Jim, that dude that's answering every question is a Russian spy. He will kill you in the streets of Des Moines later tonight. And look at how unassuming he is. It's like the guy looks like he's from Central Casting in a family sitcom. He'll have a knife in my throat after this show. I can feel it. And then after you do it, implementation, wash, rinse, repeat. Is it repeatable? And remember the early dream. I can see some people that remember this. But I, I, I see some of the younger folks. It's like, what does this do? Going back to the Andy Griffith show? Yeah, but uh, access to the data center used to be simple. It was just VPN, right? You had sexy was I have a flip phone or I have a big ass phone that's the size of my head and I have a huge laptop that's ponderous to carry around. But look at me on mobile and I have a workstation with a server the size of my legs sitting under the desk and everything's hard to move. But you could secure that. Encrypt more shit was easy. Data center, easy. You do the stuff at work. It's 1995. We have a hip environment. You can play ping pong and foosball at lunch. Imagine recruiting people now. I mean, everyone. Bob right now is sending work emails. My colleague, my buddy out there, right? Bob, you have to sit in an office in Chicago every day to work on those emails. You know how quick Bob would quit and go somewhere? Bob can work. Bob was sending emails from Greece a few weeks ago on key accounts. Bob is sending a photo. And I'm, wow, Socrates and Jim, you got to get these emails out for us for Friday. Wow. But that is what we expect. Lewis C.K.'s point, right? 30 seconds, I'm out. If your customer experience, if they're on there too long, if it takes too long, if it isn't seamless, remember, I'll quote C. I'm going in again. And this is the challenge, the ultimate in security. He has a great quote. Remember the first time you had an iPhone? How amazing that was? Holy, whoa, boom, right? Just like when you drive a superb automobile, you see where the money went, right? Now everyone expects that. And now here's where we're heading, right? Multi-cloud secure access. We're in the cloud. How long has the cloud been around, everyone? How long? You should know. I gave you the answer earlier. 50s. Cloud. Everyone, the cloud. Cloud is just extra computing space. I used to work at HP when they were laying everyone off. You go down to Plano, Texas, they'd have data centers the size of downtown Des Moines with 11 people sitting in them. 11. Hey, Jim, we have a meeting. We're going to be in the conference room on the southeast side of the building. We really need you there. We've got an incident. We need to, you, can you handle the forensic side of it? We need a report. And you think, okay, cool. I got 15 minutes. I can get a soda. I can get my orange vanilla Coke from the bar. It's like you had to rent a car. That's how much space is out there, right? Public, private, cloud, software as a service, the data center, and all the aforementioned devices that we're talking about. And now here's what we have to comprise for. Workforce mobility. Bob's a talented guy. If I want to keep him, he needs to go to Greece. He needs to go to Canada. He needs to be securely connected to all of his applications. They need to be containerized. And if anything happens to Bob's data or customer data, imagine the company we're privileged to work with, a key customer of ours. We lost your data because Bob was in Greece sending an email. Unacceptable. Goodbye, Jim and Bob right? Mobility, you have to secure it everywhere. Then you think in terms of anywhere, anytime, everywhere, appropriate access. Encrypt more shit everywhere, right? Multi-cloud, private, hybrid. You've got to comprise for the physical data center. Your organizations have invested millions upon millions of dollars in applications and processes, and these physical data centers are still very valuable. Throw them all away. We're going to go to the cloud now. We're going to go to Azure. Microsoft, I heard someone tonight 
I loved it. Smart ass remark. Well, like Microsoft's great security program. Well, we, we love Microsoft. They're a huge customer. They leverage us to do encryption and authentication, knowing that they fall short. Right? So you got to think op optimization of IT services. You have to get bit, tomorrow. I need one terabyte to do R and D, and it's got to be ultra secure because we're competing against Honda and Toyota, and we work at GM. DevOps, all that data, like nuclear output, nuclear waste, we got to sift through it. There's a huge avalanche of 500 million rocks, and there's 15 pieces of gold, and we got to find it by Thursday morning. It's got to be encrypted and secure. These are the demands, right? And then visibility. Jim, we screwed up. Bob's email got hacked from Greece. Can you give me a report on where that got hacked at? Who, what, where? Intelligence, automated response, and then IoT. I have been since 2010. I love, this is the state of our industry, the big hot topic at RSA. This is human beings versus machine. Zero trust. I trust no one. I don't trust what goes out. I don't trust what comes in. I trust no one. Isn't that upbeat and happy? Let's sing happy songs with that one, right? But we have a lot of companies. Remember, 44% of applications are coming with no security metrics built in. You have IoT. We, we have huge customers with global data centers with printers and microwaves and refrigerators that talk and vehicles vehicles worked on the nascar program at hp think in terms of all the data r d data from a vehicle manufacturing perspective and i'm going to tell you a use case i'm going to take about five to eight more minutes are we good he's like you haven't done the ballad you got to get off there he, he knows no ballads and then you think in terms of compliance is compliance getting less complicated or more complicated? Anybody? Both? <laughs> I love that. Both. That's good. There's a, there's a guy that walks the fence. <laughs> but think in terms of everything, if you're in financial services. From a financial services perspective, you have your bank account, you have your stocks, you have your 401k, and your bank now has to let me in as your financial services advisor, and I have to get access to the account too. And who's to say I'm not a shyster, and I'm not laundering your money down to the Caymans and making two cents on every dollar and putting it away in a virtual server in the Ca Cayman Islands, right? And you, as the cybersecurity expert, have to comprise for that. That's great. And then requirements for multi-enterprise cloud, like I was talking about earlier, right? It's got to be ubiquitous, secure access, encrypt more shit, monitoring, see everything at every device and be able to report on it within minutes. And, a, and there's no perimeter. So here are the fun terms of 2019 as we head into another election. How many people think that's going to be secure? I notice no one raised their hands. How many, how many th people think we can trust the information? Hence, zero trust. I don't care what side of the political fence you're on. You would have no idea who's generating. i got to give the Russians credit. Their marketing teams are sophisticated. That stuff looked real. Whether I was offended or well, I'm a little conservative on that issue, I can agree with that. That's a Russian bot, Jim, that did that. Great. We're all susceptible, right? Zero trust, no perimeter, one of the things I like to remind everyone, the data center at the end of the day is you. You're the data center. Wherever you work, our CEO, Sadaka Ramakrishna, has a great line. Because it isn't all doom and gloom. We should be able to be productive. I should be able to access my 401k. I should be able to work in front of the Kremlin and send key mission critical information that's proprietary to you and not ever worry about anyone finding it. You can encrypt, you can add additional context layers, you can have 15 people that know the codes, you can have keys digitally locked. I'm going to close with my use case, so there is a ballad coming. Here, and, and I'll get into that use case now. I was part of a team 
and uh, it's based in Detroit when I was with Bystorm. And it's, you can Google it, it's uh, 60 minutes. They have a October cybersecurity issue that's great. And they are now featuring it every other week. I mean, it's ubiquitous in the media, right? But I want, you, and you'll, some of you may remember it, but we were part of the forensics team. And General Motors had a huge advantage when it came to electrical vehicle development. Everyone's seen the Volt. People were seven years behind. The industry was seven years behind. They were way ahead of the game. And yet, and we were one, it was HP, it was Symantec, it was IBM, because they're such a huge organization with different fiefdoms that like different solutions in their environment. They had every IAM program known to mankind. They had every encryption service known to mankind. They were doing Moscow marketing meetings on one IAM program with encryption and a secure access program and doing the other marketing meetings in Australia with a different one. And when the hackers got in, they were a group of manufacturers from Asia Pacific, they sat there for 12 months and they exploited, which was what happened with Quest as well. They got in not through GM directly. They got in with their suppliers. They find vulnerable people. Percentage of people that respond even amongst us knowledgeable geniuses to phishing attacks. I'm talking all of us. And this is a three-year study. What's the percentage of people that respond to a phishing attack even as well-educated as you are? Guess. 13%. That's mind-blowing to me. Yet, there are times where you slip. You just see it, and are like, oh, no, I can't open that. Then you find out your friend did, and oh, my God, am I glad I was. Well, you, you thought about it, right? Well, at GM, those back doors were opened. Twelve months, the perpetrator sat there and then got access to that proprietary information. Seven years of competitive advantage gone. Famous FBI director at the time, James Comey, was the head of the investigation. He led it. Our forensics team was one of the forensics teams. Not a time to have a sense of humor, by the way. I walked in, then was chastised by my boss. Everything okay here? With coffee. Not a time to crack a joke. We're, we're doing all right, right? Just thought I'd lighten the mood a little. Not, not, that wasn't funny to them. Here's what ended up happening. Prosecuted three Asia Pacific manufacturers who paid a collective 1.5 billion in fines, prosecuted in the justice system of the United States. In the testimony, they openly said we did the math at $4 billion to hire out R&D, to do manufacturing, to keep up and to catch up with the General Motors competitive advantages we figured the fine would come in between one and two billion. We just saved two billion. Watch a Kia drive down the road, ladies and gentlemen, and tell me it doesn't look it. And watch it next to a Ford Fusion, a Kia. They're next to each other. All we're doing is changing the nameplate. I hope you found this compelling. I have much more. I'm Jim Hebler, happy to mix with y'all. But I hope you found this uh, to be a fun presentation. And I want to thank all of you for having me. And uh, keep up the great work, right? And thanks for participating. And I hope you found this fun, entertaining, and not like a blatant commercial. Did I do all right? I don't know any ballads. I apologize. Thanks again, everyone.